It gives me great pleasure and delight to invite Miss Ann Harbridge to the podium. Moderator, friends, and colleagues. As I sat a few weeks ago to prepare these words to share with you, I was also mulling around the text for that Sunday's sermon, Mark 6, 1 to 13. It tells of Jesus preaching in his hometown, and it goes on to talk about the, sending the disciples out to preach the gospel, to heal, and to do miracles. Jesus sent the disciples out with nothing but the tunic they were wearing, a staff, and the sandals on their feet. No bag of extras, no big binders, no food, and no money. All they had was the gospel, and if anyone didn't want to hear what they had to say, well, shake the dust from your sandals and move on. As we look at the future of the church, one has to wonder how and when things got this complicated. I believe that we need to go back to basics, who we are and what we are about. What I'm certain about is that no matter what we decide related to our structures, our policies, and our polity, the church will survive. It will survive as long as we continue to remember our purpose. And it's the same purpose that Jesus proclaimed as his mission statement from Isaiah 61, to proclaim good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to comfort all who mourn. Our church's mission is to share this message not only in words, but in our actions. When we care for the sick, when we feed the hungry, when we seek justice and resist evil, then our church is alive and well. Whatever structures we decide we need to keep things from turning into chaos. There's a lot of anxiety about the future of the church, and perhaps it's time to take a deep breath. Consider what that anxiety is really about. Maybe the anxiety is the dust that we need to shake from our sandals. My hope for the church is that we can be a joy-filled place a place that honors and praises the one who created us. My hope is that our structures and our need to have everything clearly laid out won't hold us back from opening our hearts and minds to the possibilities that might exist if we simply focus on the reason we are the church in the first place. Are our structures more of the dust to be shaken off? As a church, we can and must be leaders in our communities and our country as we seek to build right relations with the indigenous people who lived and loved and had their being on this land long before our ancestors even knew this land existed. My experiences at the TRC in both Edmonton and Ottawa have led me to be a passionate voice, sharing the stories that I have heard and determined to help others hear those stories so that reconciliation can happen. Our church may not be the voice we once were, but we still have a voice and we need to use it. As our world becomes an ever smaller place, we need to consider how our actions affect others both near and far through such things as climate change and dwindling non-renewable resources. We need to consider how the wealth of countries like Canada can be shared more equally with those who have little. We need to listen and engage with our youth, with our seniors, and with everybody in between. In so many ways, the church is returning to its roots. We don't have the influence we once had. There are many who haven't heard and don't want to hear what we have to say. But that didn't stop the disciples and it needn't stop us. We have good news to share and that good news has nothing to do with structures. Perhaps it can be best shared if we become more nimble by shedding the things that are holding us back and slowing us down. When the disciples sent Jesus out, or sorry, when Jesus sent the disciples out, they didn't have structures, they didn't have money, they didn't even have food. What they had more than anything else was trust in the one who sent them out. Here we are today at church sharing the same message that they shared. So perhaps we need to celebrate what we have, use it to the best of our ability, and see what happens from here. Perhaps we also need to talk less about how and why and just shake the dust from our sandals and get on with living the gospel message in all the places where we live our lives. Perhaps we need to trust more and worry less about the who and the how and get on with the what. Do we have the courage and the will to do it? I do, and so I've allowed my name to go forward as a moderator because I believe my gifts and skills are what our church needs today. 
My knowledge of the church and the at the Presbyterian conference levels have shown me what's working and what is simply extra baggage that we tend to use to control things that might not need to be controlled. However we decide to structure ourselves, my gifts in communication and in inspiring others to see beyond those things that are holding them back will be needed. I believe that I can be a calm presence in the midst of chaos. In fact, I don't think it has to be chaos at all if we trust one another and trust God. Let's do that and share the joy of the experience together. Thanks be to God. There's a song in every silence Seeking word and melody There's a dawn in every darkness Bringing hope to you and me From the past will come the future What it holds a mystery Unrevealed until it Something God alone can see. It gives me great pleasure and delight to invite Mr. Michael Schubert to the podium. Friends, I stand before you ready and willing to be your next moderator open to the possibilities for our church. Mes amis, je me tiens humblement devant vous, prêt et disposé à être votre prochaine moderateur, ouverte aux possibilités de Dieu pour notre l'Église. In my camping days, I was an expert campfire builder. I could build a campfire for any purpose, a big roaring campfire for that sing song a low, hot campfire for cooking. I loved waking up early in the morning to find only hot ash left in the campfire pit. I was amazed that you could get ready to cook breakfast by simply placing a few new logs onto that hot ash. Add a little stir, some good old lung power, and fire erupts. It is time to allow the flames to erupt from the ash of who we once were by placing new fuel onto the ashes of our history. Ruah, God's breath blows new life. God in us and through us. But first we need to trust and let the fire go out that our ash may be revealed in order that a new fire can burn. This new fire is resurrection. All too often, we fight resurrection, not wanting what we love to die. How can we be a resurrection people if we fight new life? We remember on a beach, Jesus called to them, come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew who it was. Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them. And he did the same with the fish. Jesus is again and again made known to them in the breaking of bread. He broke bread with the disciples next to a campfire to be with them and to prepare them to be bread breakers for the world. And Jesus calls us too. Do we accept his gracious invitation, his commanding invitation to follow him, knowing that our life will never be the same again. My truth is, though, that I have been a nervous, bread-breaking disciple, full of privilege and power that I seek to understand, shed, and share. I have felt this feeling in my ministry many times, in South Africa and India serving as an overseas partner on a year-long program. While listening and being opened at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission event in Edmonton. While answering rapid-fire questions at, as a GCE rep at our presbytery meetings about the comprehensive review. While pitching the GO project as a new full-time ministry for our church. I have been opened 
to ashen experiences at the weekly intentional community meal in Paris while visiting a young teen in the hospital with a cancer diagnosis and standing before you now. These are moments that I've experienced resurrection only first because I was broken down to ash. As I reflect on these experiences, I realize that it can be more comfortable to be an institutional people rather than a discipleship people. Sometimes our institutional rules and dogma cause us to forget that we are to be bread breakers in the world. The comprehensive review is not going to save the church. The discipleship of its members will. That is us, here and now. We are called to be reconciled with our communities, with the world and all of creation, to break bread with all those we meet. And this is done one moment, one discipleship moment at a time. If new fire is what we seek for the church, then bread breaking, that is relationship, is our call. It is our new fuel. Look around you right now. We are experiencing resurrection here at our table groups. See how the youth have carried this spark of resurrection across our country? And we witness new life in the faces of those in this space and the spaces that we travel from. Friends, as moderator, I will pray for, walk with, and encourage the church to say yes to resurrection and no to everything that stands in its way. I will offer leadership that is brave, consistent, humorous, pastoral, challenging, hope-filled, and real. With God's grace, together we will be the church to say yes to resurrection and no to everything that stands in its way. Thank you. Spirit God, be our breath, be our song, blow through us, bringing strength to move on, through change, through challenge, we'll greet the new dawn, Spirit God, be our song. It gives me great pleasure and delight to invite Reverend Dr. John Young to the podium. When the General Council met in Newfoundland and Labrador in 1964, the Premier, Joey Smallwood, invited the commissioners and guests to a reception at his home. The Lieutenant Governor, Fabrian O'Day, invited all the commissioners to an official reception at Government House. And the province of Newfoundland held a formal state dinner for the General Council. So what do you think when you look at those archival photos? It seems like a different world. And in fact, it was a different world. And we were a different church. We were bigger, we were better off, and we had influence in society. Some people talk about the concept of exile as a way of describing the difference between our situation now and the world of those photos. Now, in exile, exile is a place where you are displaced or uprooted. It has other meanings, but that's the one that matters for us because we as a church have been displaced in our society and culture. Exile acknowledges lament and loss. But I think it's important for another reason. In exile, a religious tradition either reinvents itself or it dies. Modern Judaism was born in the exile in Babylon. In our exile from the world in those photos I showed, we need as a church to reinvent ourselves. Every denomination has certain key principles, those parts of our ethos that make us who we are. In reinventing, there has to be a continuity from that even as we change to adapt to a different time and context. I want to talk about three of those things tonight. Premier 
une partie de la vision de nos fondateurs et fondatrices était que l'Église unie soit une Église qui favorise l'esprit d'unité avec les autres dénominations. Dans une société laïque, dominée par le consumérisme, nous avons les plus en commun avec ceux qui cherchent aussi à vivre leur vie selon la foi qu'ils professent. À notre époque, nous voulons continuer de travailler avec les personnes qui appartiennent à d'autres religions. Second, we need, as we did until about the mid 1960s, to see social action and evangelism as linked together. Evangelism means sharing the good news, sharing our faith story. Recently, the Reverend Dr. Anthony Bailey of Parkdale United in Ottawa gave me a helpful term. He noted that we are good at walking our talk, that is, living our lives according to our faith convictions. But he said, we need to learn how to talk our walk, that when asked, we're able to share those faith convictions that ground our social action. So I'm not talking about evangelism as we did it in the 1950s. I'm talking about being ready to answer when someone says, what do you believe and why? Third, a lesson from my cat, Sudi. We got Sudi after someone dumped him in the rural area where we live on a cold winter's weekend. About a year later, we got a puppy. Sudi, desperate for a playmate, overlooked the fact that cats don't get along with dogs. So he played with Tyler, the puppy. And Tyler shared his food with the cat. A year later, we got a second puppy, Sheba. And the dog and cat taught the new puppy, the cat's your friend. You can even lie down together. We need to be like Sudi and his doggy friends. Maybe in the past, we could afford to think of groups, liberal conservative, clergy lay, cis trans, the way we divide people. We can't now. We'll disagree, of course, but in an inclusive church, we need to work together. En notre époque, nous vivons dans une, dans une, nous vivons dans une temps avec beaucoup de défis. Dans ce temps, nous devons nous rappeler de la promesse de Dieu. Je suis avec toujours, avec vous toujours. C'est une promesse qui est trouvée aussi dans les mots de nos professions de foi, dans la vie, dans la mort, et dans la vie au-delà de la mort. Dieu est avec nous. Nous ne sommes pas seuls. Grâce rendue à Dieu. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Meg Rich. It gives me great pleasure and delight to invite Reverend Dave Jagger to the podium. Moderator, 
General Counsel. The last one. <laughs> it's quiz time. Ready? What's my favorite book of the Bible? Jonah, correct. Somebody did their homework. When I first felt pushed by the Spirit to offer myself for the position of moderator, there was a great deal of me pushing back. Jonah. And I suspect that most of you in paid accountable ministry can also relate to this, as can those in other forms of ministry outside of the church. A bazillion questions tormented me. Ultimately, though, the hardest thing about this whole journey so far has been learning to live in a state of unknowing. What if I'm chosen? What if I'm not chosen? It's something that I think all of us are experiencing right now when we try to look ahead into the future as individuals, as local congregations, as a denomination. We are all living in a state of unknowing, and it's hard. Those are the times that we depend upon our roots, the experiences and lessons that we have learned that support us and nurture us to grow, especially in times that are hard. When I was 27 years old, which is longer ago than I want to talk about, and living three provinces away from most of my family, on my settlement charge with my wife and my three-year-old son, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, cancer. Talk about a time of unknowing. Should we move home, back to Ontario? Should I leave ministry? What would treatment be? Was there treatment? How long would I live? And I can remember standing in the manse in Valley View, Alberta, holding and being held by Deb, as God gave me the words that I needed then and that I share with you today. Didn't know that then, of course. Words of grace. The rules of the game have not changed, only the playing field. Which left me with the challenge of discerning the rules, the way, the way of faith. I prayed, I listened, and the words of Jesus spoke, Hear, O Israel, for the Lord your God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with everything you have and everything you are. And the second is, as the first, love your neighbor as you love yourself. For me, those are the rules. That is my purpose, my mission, my why. So then all I had to figure out was what's the how. How to live my faith, how to do those two things that Jesus identified as most important in the new context that we were about to enter, the new playing field, moving to a new strange city in order to enter the world of cancer treatment. Well, it seems to me that the same is true for us as the United Church of Canada today. The rules of the game haven't changed, only the playing field. So my question to you as General Counsel and to the entire United Church of Canada is, in this time of unknowing, what if, instead of spending the next three years only arguing about structure, and slowly sucking the life out of ourselves, and even potentially fracturing the church, what if we spend an equal amount of time, or, or maybe more, having those energy-creating, passion-stirring, anything-is-possible kind of conversations, in order that we can rediscover the common mission and purpose that God is calling us to be about, the rules, the way, our why. Then we will be in a place to address the how. How will we, how will you live out those rules, our mission, that have been rooting us for the last 90 years in order that we can grow new shoots on a new playing field? Should you choose me as your next moderator, I will keep asking you those kinds of questions. And when I come to visit you, and I will, I hope you will be ready to share with me and with the whole church your answers. And don't forget, in all things, God works for good. 
Trust me. Thank you. joy and pain of living as I love